Hey, everybody. My name is Regina Bryan, and welcome to the Women of Empowered Living. I have yet another phenomenal, dynamic woman from right here in our community. Not only is she one of our members, she's also a team ambassador, and we appreciate the work she does so much. Everybody, please welcome Joe Whip. Hey, Joe. Hi. Hi, Regina. Hi, everybody. It's great to have you here today. How are you? I'm wonderful. Very wonderful. <laughs> and where in the world are you joining us from today? I'm in the Central Valley of uh, California. Awesome. Clear across the country for me, but California is a place that I love so much. So thanks so much for being here, Joe. Thank you for having me. I'm very honored to be here. Oh, and, and Joe, you like so many of us, we support amazing causes. I'm very close to a children's organization and you support work around human trafficking. It's almost something I can't even wrap my mind around. So if you will talk to us about how you became involved with human trafficking. Why is this, why is this particular cause so important to you? It's always really hard for me to address this aspect of it. Um, I had some abuse in my childhood and um, multiple rapes. When I was 19, um, I was strangled. And um, the only reason I'm alive right now is because God intervened. It was really quite a miraculous story. And I don't like to tell that story because people don't like hearing it. But the reality is I left that experience with this feeling inside of me that sometime, somewhere, God would redeem it. Um, you know, beauty, beauty from ashes. It, it was a very difficult time. I, I was unsupported. And what came out of it for me was I knew after I started learning about human trafficking, I knew that I could have easily have been one of these girls. It, 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 if it had been a different time or a different person, I would have been one of them. And that really, that really like hit me. It hit me hard. And I was, I, I just was looking for what it was that God was going to do. And one day I was in my chiropractor's office and he said, he had this sign and I'm like, oh, well, you know about this? No. So anyway, I'm like, I know this is it. This is the moment. And uh, I've been involved ever since, been eight and a half years. Wow, that's a long time. So you've seen a lot of change and a lot of movement in this organization. But let's go back for a second because you said you weren't very supported when you went through the things you went through with the rape, um, yeah. with being strangled. What does that do to you, Joe, when a, when a woman or anyone for that matter goes through something like that? If you don't mind sharing with us a little bit about what that's like and how did that drive you to really want to take on such a huge, huge cause like this? Regina, every, every human has a right to be loved and to be honored as a human. And when you go through something like that, uh, the emotional trauma, and you are not allowed to to um, express the pain and to be validated, it affects how you view yourself. You do not see your worth. You do not know your value. You lose the identity of who you're meant to be. When we are dealing with women and men, uh, boys and girls who are brought out of trafficking, the trauma is so severe and they are caught so deeply that it is very normal for them to go back to their pimps eight to 12 times or even back into the, the life because it is neurologically programmed into them at that point. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to help release it. Now, I have always been very strong-minded and I was very determined and I have often said that I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for God and what he's done for me. And so I know that that is a way for us to look at this is to know that these people are deeply wounded and that validating them and treating them not like a product and not like a, a drug addict that's often you will you committed a crime. No, they didn't they may have created crime in the sense of the legal, but they were forced into it by the lifestyle that someone forced them into. So talk to us about that. That's a great segue. Talk to us about how does, how does a young man or a young woman, 
how do they become involved in this industry? Typically, I'm guessing there's probably multiple ways this, this happens, but what can you teach us about how someone even enters this industry? Well, it's often believed that this is only children who come out of um, bad homes and trauma. It it isn't actually true. In fact, uh, Brianna, who is one of the people who is a spokesperson for Shared Hope International, who I'm an ambassador with, she was uh, going to high school and college, working towards becoming a nurse. She had a job. She was an A student. This girl was one of those girls that parents are so proud of. Mm -hmm. And uh, this older gentleman kept coming into the restaurant where she worked. He was very kind, very friendly, asked her lots of questions, and she just answered him. She's just this nice guy who comes into the Mm -hmm. coffee shop. Six months. This is a business. Always remember human trafficking is a business. Six months later, this young man comes in with a couple, you know, a few of his friends, and they start talking to her, and they're doing what's called shopping. They want to know if they want her to be one of the people oh, that oh, they wow. want to so traffic. Called shopping. There's a term for it. Oh, yes. They actually have trainings. They teach each other what to do. There is actually a book called Pimpology where you can learn to pimp. Okay. It- so, so <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me make sure I didn't miss this. There's a book on how to do this, on how to be a pimp. And it's like on Amazon or the, and the bookstore. Is that what you're telling us? Um, well, I don't know exactly where to find it because okay, I've never but Googled there's a book. it, but there's a book. <laughs> yes. Yes. So anyway, um, they shopped her and he started the, bo- the one boy became the boyfriend. Um, he just happened to like her favorite places. He just happened to live in her favorite city and she really liked him. So they started dating. Eventually he had her in a strip club. She had to return a car to her parents. And so she was uh, a boyfriend, an ex-boyfriend, uh, was the only person she trusted to talk to because she didn't want anyone to know what she was doing. So she, um, she says to this guy, hey, I'm going to drop my car off. Well, his father had gone to a Rotary Club meeting where they had talked about trafficking and his father had talked with him. And he said, gee, this reminds me of what dad had said about people who are trafficked. To make a long story short, um, Linda Smith, who is the co- uh, who is the founder of Shared Hope International, ended up speaking with her that night when she came down with her car. She realized that she was in the process of being trafficked, and they also uh, discovered that the next place she was going to, where she was supposed to meet up with him for a, or for a weekend together, was going to be when she was sold. Oh my gosh. We, we have this idea, Joe, I have this idea that the, the young people that become involved, the young ladies or young men, that they're runaways or they're from broken homes. And what you're telling us is that's not always the case. No, it isn't. And now a higher percent would be. Sure. And actually now the very, very uh, high percent are coming out of social media. It is much more being found with uh, people being drawn in through social media. And tell us a little, this is so fascinating because until you and I spoke last week, I didn't really have a glimmer as to how this worked. So talk to us how it works with social media. It's, it's tragically simple. Um, a, a 60 year old man can easily pretend to be a 16 year old boy on social media. Mm. And a 14 year old girl who is on social media gets all these nice, lovely compliments. And then he says he wants to meet her or he says, take a picture of yourself. And first it's just a normal picture. And then it's a, Hey, show me your legs or whatever. And it eventually she's exposed herself enough that he then uses that. If you don't, I will show. And, and, and it's just a normal tactic. This is just the way they play the game. Wow. Oh my gosh. And you've been involved for eight years. Yes. What has been your biggest eye-opening experience um, around this movement? Maybe how it's changed or how it's grown? What would you like to share with us about the evolution during your eight years? 
you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that it's hard to imagine that Linda Smith started this uh, company, uh, excuse me, this organization over 20 years ago. So I perceived girls on the corner as right. being those kind of girls. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know any better. Now I knew not all of it was good and not all of it was that way, but I didn't really think a lot about it until I started really, really learning about it. Um, what has been the biggest sad eye-opening thing that's gone on is the severe damage that COVID has had on these children. We have had a very, very high number. It, it, it has literally gone up hundred, I mean, hundreds of thousands of percent. It's just exploded. So You've COVID, got, so yes. when COVID hit us last year, what you're saying is this industry exploded. Yes. Well, think about it. We're all sitting here right now in front of a screen. Mm -hmm. I'm not in a, a, an interview place with you. And uh, some, some guy lost his job or he's kind of dissatisfied. He's stuck at home and he's grumpy and upset. And, you know, he wants to feel good. And you got some kid who's now stuck at home, staring at a computer all day. And mom is still trying to make the ends meet. There's a lot more online and it has just gone crazy. I mean, our kids, our young people are really in danger, whether you come from a rocky home or whether you come from one of the best homes. When you sit these preteen and teenage girls, in particular boys, in front of a computer screen and they're making contact with people that are complimenting them and maybe luring them in some kind of way, you're telling us that there are many ways our young people are at risk and COVID and social media just compounds that. Correct. It has grown, it has grown exponentially in one year. You know what? I never would have thought that and it makes sense. I remember hearing early on from during our time when COVID first hit us last March, last April, and my husband and I, because we were by coastal for a bit, we have a place in LA. And I remember hearing the LA sheriff say that the calls, that the um, calls about possible potential abuse from teachers, from school nurses and from coaches has, has went away. They would get around a thousand calls a day about these child abuse tips. Suddenly, nothing. And you think about all the children that are in dangerous situations, what you're saying now about COVID and everybody stuck at home for a while, that makes perfect sense. And I never really thought about that until you just shared that. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And, and you know, people, it, it's hard to go and tell your child, I'm sorry, but I have to look at your phone. It's, yeah. it's hard to be engaged on that, but you, you may save their life. It, it, it's so much bigger. You know, they, they start to act a little funny. They become a little bit more standoffish. They, they snap at you in ways that you're not, you're like, I don't understand. And they start saying things like you're too snoopy and just a little things like that. And, and you have to, those have to be red flags. Um, one of the things that um, I'm going to be offering everybody is going to be some tips and things for them to be able to look at that can help them as parents, but it can also help them when they're out and about town, because we could be in a grocery store line with someone who's being trafficked. They could be now, with their pimp. And now when I go to the airport, especially here in Atlanta, being the, the world's busiest, and I know now the last few times I've traveled, I see those signs, I think in every bathroom stall. And I think in most every airport I've been in saying that if you are being trafficked, here's the 1-800 number. Here's how you can go and get help and let somebody know. I'm seeing those signs in the ladies room in the stall. Correct. And uh, Atlanta, Georgia happens to be the number one uh, airport in the world for trafficking. Because it's huge. That... Um, that really blows my mind. That really blows my mind. So Joe, because you're so, I mean, thank you for the education because I think a lot of our audience watching might be a little bit like me. We hear this term human trafficking and yet it's so big and it's almost too much for your heart to handle. So I sort of keep a little bit of a safe distance. Hmm. I'll, I'll admit that. I, I, I don't wanna know that the young women 
and what they're going through and how easily that it just could have been any one of us. Yes. I've been in the grocery store. I've been out riding my bike as a, as a preteen girl, you know, because back in the day, our parents didn't keep as tight of a, you know, we were riding around the neighborhood. It was just so easy. And now the challenges that our young people grow up with, our young women grow up with, um, it's overwhelming. I've kept, I, I've kept a safe distance almost because my heart and my mind can't handle it. So, you know, it's, it's funny that you should mention that because I, I, one of my favorite stories to tell is the story of one of my very dear friends who I've worked with. We volunteered together for many years with North County abolitionists here in California. And um, I'll just call her Annie. That's not her name, but um, she, she used to tell me, I, I know enough. I don't want to know anymore. It hurts my heart too much, but I also can't do nothing about it. So instead of being in the front where, you know, I was doing training, teaching and things like that and answering questions, she was in the back, you know, making cookies and cupcakes and coffee and lemonade. She couldn't hear it. She couldn't do it anymore. She didn't even like coming to the meetings because we would discuss stuff. Right. But she was there um, just being part of it and doing something. And it doesn't have to be actually serving in that capacity um, I am going to give everybody uh, who decides that they want to connect with me um, 10 ways that they can help. There are so many ways to help without give you having to know thoughts. anymore. Give us a couple of thoughts now. I, I want to hear what you're doing. But before we go that route, tell us, give us just a couple of small things, because this is my this is a big step for me, um, because I want it again. I wanted to be standoffish. And when you and I had that great talk, you, you can't unknow it now. We can't pretend. And you kind of hit me in the gut, Joe, when you said, oh, Atlanta, Georgia, that's the, that's the busy hub. That's, and I'm thinking, I, that's my home airport. I travel quite a bit every year. I have a lot of happy memories because usually my trips have been very happy, fun, vacation, work related. So to know what's going on behind the scenes in that airport, that I'm walking by people that are potentially being that are caught up in that it's so tell us what it's we can hard, do it's so hard to know all the details um and and you know i want to i want to i want to segue into this um first knowing something is very important getting some basic information including um putting the human trafficking hotline into your phone so Ooh, that if you great step so put yeah, it's, it's, phone. yes, having it with you, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a horrible story that happened to me. I had been in the fight in human trafficking for probably five years. I had um, started a group called North County Abolitionists. We were already doing a lot of things. I was speaking, I was teaching. I have uh, my daughter, um, Haley has Down syndrome. I, I watch over her. We were at a truck stop and I saw a girl in the bathroom and I knew. I knew that she was a trafficked girl, but I was with my daughter and I didn't know what to do. And I remembered I had that phone number. So I memorized every detail about her and I thought I was doing the right thing. And um, went out to my car, got my daughter situated, got out of the car and called didn't want to call in front of her, told her what was going on. To, and um, they said, what truck did she get into? Did you see? And when I told them that I didn't, they said, we're never going to be able to find her. That weighs on my heart. Every time I tell that story, I, I just, I don't know what ever happened to her. Now I pray for her and I believe in the power of prayer, but I will never let that happen again. I'm going to be smarter next time. That one tip and that one story of yours is a game changer because I never would have thought about putting it in my phone. And now you gave us a, a reason what you've been through. And you can tell Joe, this, this, this girl has not left your heart, has she? No, she hasn't. <clears throat> she never will. 
So, so talk to us about what you're doing. Uh, what are your goals? What would you like to see happen? What's your major contribution going to be? Because I know you're working on some great things. I am. The hard part for me is working on one thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I, I am. Um, I am working on a few things. One, I am working on trying to get on to a God Made Millionaire TV show. You get interviewed, you're out in front of millions, and I can talk about my subject. Uh, the second thing that I'm working on doing is I'm working on something called the Do Something Matrix, which um, is for people who are interested in becoming advocates, but they don't know where they personally will fit in. It's almost mm -hmm. like a coaching software uh, that I've been working on. Ah. The third thing that I am doing is I am working on, and, and this one's a, 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 a work in progress. I'm working on trying to help people who are advocates and caregivers to become strong and to know that what they're doing requires them to take care of themselves. We have a habit as caregivers and advocates to feel that we must be going and doing all the time. But if you go and you do all the time, you are suffocating yourself. You need to put on your oxygen mask and you need to take really good care of yourself because the world needs you. We sure do. And the fourth thing that I do, and, and this is something everybody can do, doesn't cost a dime, it does take time. Invest in when you see posts about human trafficking, share. Mm. I have a woman, she's, because of where her situation, she's not able to do much. Every time I post anything on human trafficking, she shares my work. And this, this has power. Yeah. So those are just a few things right there that people can do. I'm so glad you mentioned that about sharing the posts that we see on human trafficking and all of you watching, especially if you're an ambassador, but everybody in our empowered living community, if you didn't share this show now, you know, it's going to be replay. You know, the video link is available. Please share this show. Rarely do I ask that. Um, this is just really important that all of us do just something small that any of us can do. And that is just drive awareness. I didn't want to drive awareness because I didn't want to know. And I didn't want to know because it's breaking my heart. And, and yet we can all do that. We can all do that. Um, Joe, I want to ask you about your book because, you know, when 2020 struck, we were all sort of stuck at home and, and you're in California. So you're still quite a bit stuck at home. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we made good use of our time and, and sometimes we didn't. You really did. And you wrote a book. Talk to us about how you spent quarantine and talk to us about this book. Well, you know, um, when it first happened, it, the big thing was there's no toilet paper. <laughs> okay. There's no toilet paper. And I'm like, well, I got toilet paper, but what if I run out? I, so I told my daughter, I said, Haley, we got to get in the car. We got to start hunting for toilet paper because I'd rather <laughs> look now than not have it later. Right. So, so I'm 12 stores into it. And, and, and what I'm seeing 12 stores in. Yeah. It took 17 by the way, but, but I'm 12 stores, stores into this adventure. And um, I'm seeing on the faces of people, this outrageous amount of pain and fear and, and anger. And I kept thinking, wow, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen, but this is not the way to approach this. And so it, it kept driving me nuts. And I thought, well, I need to give some people some ideas of what to do. And then I was like, okay, well, what am I going to do? So one of the things that I started doing was when I went out, I made sure that I tried to have a really good conversation with at least one person that put some light into their life. I love it. Them to feel happier, lighter, even if they had to vent a little bit. And then I tried to end it nicely. I did my best to turn a conversation around and bring some light into people's lives. Wow. And the other thing was, I tried to make sure that even with a mask on, that I was <laughs> smiling at people because people do see, you know, the windows of the soul. That's they right. do see whether you're grumpy or sad 
or whatever you're feeling, it will show in your eyes. And so I worked on trying to not only say something nice, but I worked on trying to show it in my eyes when I was with people in public. And I started writing these things down. And the other thing that I did was I started thinking about people who were at home, what they could do while they were at home to make their lives a little less stressful and complicated with uh, the unexpected. Now there are four kids under my roof while I'm trying to work and they, I have to homeschool them. And I don't even know what that is. And all these things were just exploding and people were really stressed. So my book is instead of reacting to crisis, what can we do to respond to crisis in a positive way? And that's why it's called testing positive. I love that. It's the coolest idea. It's the coolest name for a book. And I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, last year was COVID. It was social justice unrest, a a ridiculously horrendous presidential season, election season. And you know what? We're still feeling the remnants of all of that. And now more than ever, we need that positivity in our, in our lives. And each and every one of us can do that too. Not only can we share this show and share anytime we see human trafficking messages, we can share positive messages. I, I just love that the toilet paper hunt, the adventure. <laughs> Thank God my mom's a hoarder, by the way, because I got to go to her house and grab a couple of rolls before my husband and I were in a bad way. Um, I love that you were able to turn that whole adventures in toilet paper into this book and into something really positive in people's lives. And I think that's what our community is about. Absolutely. And I, and I do talk about this community in the book, just simply because living an empowered life is um, just so much more than our all being together. You were reading my mind. So if you want to expand on that, that's our favorite question around here, Joe, you know that. Yes, I do. What does an empowered life Uh, mean to you? What does that look like? An empowered life for me is where more than just empowering myself and becoming the best me that I can be, it's where I'm able to empower others. And more than being able to empower others, put them into a place where they feel that they're the hero in their own lives instead of the victims. I love that, Joe. You know, All the interviews I do have been fascinating and wonderful. I have to tell you, this one struck a nerve. This one hit me right in my heart. You brought us the painful reality that we really need to hear. And on behalf of everybody, I hope you guys are feeling like I feel. I'm just grateful that you did. This is too big of an issue. It's it's too much of an industry. It's it's how many millions or billions of dollars? This is a big industry, isn't it? Am I right about that, that it's billions? Oh, yes. And, and as I often say, it's tax free. They're, they're not. They're, they're just it's all underground and it's all in front of our faces. So this was an important show. It was a really important show for me, because if you guys just gain a little bit of awareness like I did, and if you start to share more and, and just make these little small one, two step, put the number in your phone, which I'm doing as soon as Joe and I are finished. That's, that's how we start to make a difference. And I know that's what this community is all about. Joe, my friend, I have, I mean, I respected you and adored you before. Now my hat's off to you. The work you're doing is, is just, it, it's, it's courageous. And I appreciate it. Thank you, Regina. Thank, thank you very so, much. Thank you for being here, Joe. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.